Amen. You guys can be seated. Welcome to church, everybody. How we doing on this beautiful California sunny morning, man? When I I thought I was moving away from this when I moved from Atlanta over a year ago, and I'm like, man, this is crazy. I heard there was snow like just up the hill a little bit. Anybody in Cameron Park who had some so- snow this morning? A few of you, you know. Okay, so you brave the weather, you brave the storm. You're here. Praise God. It's going to be an awesome day. Hey, one thing, I just I, I want to give one more personal invitation for next week. And I know life's crazy. I know you may have a lot of things going on. But I want to encourage you not to miss Vision Sunday next week. We're calling it Motion Sunday. And it's all about how we as the church are fueling the movement of God on earth. And really who we're called to be, what we're a part of. And there are going to be so many stories shared, so many things talked about that God is doing in our church and really the prayer the the desire for us is where he's taking us in the days ahead and what he's calling us to be as his church in the world and and we're in a series right now in on the book of Nehemiah that I'm calling rise and build rise and build and really the the heartbeat of this series is all about who are we as the church what are we doing? What, what are we a part of here? Do, we, do you see yourself connected to the overarching story of history and connected to what God is doing in the world? Do you see yourself as someone more than somebody who just shows up on a Sunday morning to, to hear a message and to sing songs together, but really is somebody who's a part of building something? You're a builder, and I said this last week, God designed you and created you to build. It started with Lincoln Logs when you were a kid, and it moved all the way up into adulthood. And now we as as humans, and especially as Americans, we're builders, aren't we? We know how to to build portfolios, careers, infrastructures. We know how to build cities. We know how to build stuff. That's what we do. We build civilizations. We build things with our lives. And so the question is this. What are you going to spend your life building? And are you going to spend your life building things that have ultimate significance and ultimate importance for all of eternity, not just the next hundred years? And I got to say, I I need to repent for something I said last week, and I'm just going to own this right now. I think I've never gotten so many emails after a sermon in my life, okay, or just personal comments. I, I had some very kind people like, you know, accost me in the hallway and say, don't say that again. And I said last week, I don't know if you remember this, I said, you know, it doesn't matter if God gives you 70 or 80 years on this earth. And I had a bunch of people be like, 70 or 80 years? God's given me 100, maybe 120, okay? I'm already there at the 70 mark. And so here's the deal. However long gives you, however long the Lord gives us on planet earth, wherever you're at in that spectrum, you're called to build. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put a limitation on anybody in this room, (laughs) on nobody in this room. God has your days numbered, and he's not done with you yet, whether you are 10 years old or 90 years old in this room. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I I repent, I apologize for saying that last week, but I want to look at a couple verses to kick us off this week. I'm going to look at a couple things to kind of frame our talk. We're going to be diving into Nehemiah, but I want to look at two verses off the top. Nehemiah 2.20, we'll start with that one. It says this, it says, the God of heaven... The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build. God is for us. He's the one building this thing. God is the one who started Rolling Hills Church 24 years ago, and he's the one who is for Rolling Hills and will make it prosper in the days ahead. God is for the church. He's the one building every church in Sacramento. He's building Vintage Grace and District and Bayside and every other church that you know about in this area, whether it's River City Christian or Capital Christian or Lake Hills or Sun Hills or whatever Hills Church is in this area or Lake Church or whatever. I never moved to an area with so many Lake, Hills, Oaks, whatever churches on the planet. But the truth is, God is building his church, he's behind the church, and he will make it prosper. And last week, I I said, you know, if you look at the stats, and Barna Group has a ton of stats about this, but if you look at the stats of the church in America, the stats are quite depressing. You know, the church in America in the West is in significant decline. And I said last week, "You're, you're a part of an anomaly, you're a part of a rare thing, a growing church. A church that's growing and thriving. Last year alone, Rolling Hills grew by 15%. Praise God. 
We've had over 200 people go through our new attenders lunch who say, I want to be all in. I want to be a part of what God is doing here. <clears throat> and the amazing thing is this, that across our country, across our country, the, the church is in severe decline. There are over 60% of churches in America did not baptize one person last year and did not lead one person to Christ. 60% of the churches in America. By the grace of God, I mean, we had, we had 17 people say yes to Jesus on Christmas Eve, and we had six people last week give their life to Jesus for the first time on a Connect card just saying, I made a first-time commitment to Christ. Six Connect cards that we followed up with this week, and Miss Carol at the front desk, you probably talked to her if you were one of those people. Every time I listen to Miss Carol at the front desk, I'm like, I want to get saved again. Like, she... <laughs> She's like, you take one step towards Jesus and he runs to you. And I'm like, amen, Miss Carol. I'm getting saved. Let me just kneel down and pray with you in the front office right now. But Miss Carol is amazing. And I'm like, man, God, you're doing something. That's six lives. Six people from death to life. Last week you said, I'm making a new start with Christ. We had over 100 baptisms last year. A hundred ba We can celebrate that. A hundred baptisms. And I'm like, man, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you're not done with this church. Thank you that you're not done with the church. And, and the truth is, if you look at the church in America, it can be depressing. But the moment you lift your eyes off of Europe and America and the Western world where the church is, where people are getting too smart to be Christians or whatever it may be, whatever their, their post-enlightenment, post-modern thoughts may be about what Christianity is and how we are now living in a post-Christian culture. But the moment... You lift your eyes and you look at Asia and you look at Africa and you look at the majority of the world, Christianity is growing like wildfire. Wildfire. There are hundreds and thousands of people being won to Christ day after day all across the world because God is building his church and he will make it prosper. And so the, the call to us here is how do we get on board with what Jesus is doing? How do we be a part of building what he's building in the world? The other verse I want to look at to frame our time is Matthew 16, verse 15 to 18. It says this. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, um, who do you say that I am? He asks, you know, who do others say that I am? Then he looks at his disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're Jesus. You're the Messiah. That's what he says. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus says, I will build this church. I will build my church. My church will be built on the knowledge of who I am, the Son of God. My church will be built on a rock that will not be shaken. And so Jesus is building his church. He's building this church and he is inviting you to be a part of the bigger story, to be a part of what he is building on earth. Amen. So here's what I, I want to start with an illustration. I'm a big podcast guy. I don't know if anybody in here is into podcasts, but I recently came across a podcast that's hosted by NPR radio because I'm an old soul at heart. And yes, I love NPR and it's this NBR radio uh, podcast that's called How I Built This. How I Built This. And it interviews some of the top entrepreneurs and influencers and billionaires on the planet. And it says, how did you build what you have? How did you do this? And the very first episode, there was an interview with a guy named Richard Branson. You may have heard of him, right? He's one of the, the richest men on planet Earth. And I'm not advocating Richard Branson's lifestyle or any of these other things. I'm just saying it was a fascinating interview because they asked him, they said, they said, Richard, how did you turn a simple record shop in London, on the east side of London, into a guy that, that into a company called Virgin, right? Which is a massive company with over 200 smaller companies under its umbrella. How did you transform it into a cell phone company, a fleet of cruise ships, an airline, a bank, a space tourism line, a cola, and over 200 other businesses? How did you build that thing? And I loved it because he opens with this question and he goes, well, my first step was to drop out of high school. <laughs> this is the first step in building this multi-bajillion dollar empire. Well, I dropped out of high school. And he's like, well, what'd you do next? He's like, I started a magazine. 
goes, how old were you? I was 15 years old. Well, how'd you know how to start a magazine? He's like, I had no clue. He goes, the best way to do anything is to jump in the deep end and learn how to swim. And so I went walking around town. He goes, I was fired up about protesting the Vietnam War at that time. So there were a lot of people who were on board with that idea. And as a 16-year-old, I went around and sold ads to people and said, you need to advertise in my magazine. And they said, how many subscribers do you have? He's like, zero, but soon I'll have 100,000. And within two years, he had 100,000 people in the UK subscribing to his magazine as a 17-year-old kid. He goes, I literally, I'd call up Pepsi on the phone and say, hey, Coca-Cola's going to advertise in our magazine. You should do it. And then he'd call up Coca-Cola and say, hey, Pepsi's going to advertise in our magazine. You should jump on board. And so the guy was just jumping in the deep end. He was figuring it out. He was getting the best photographers, cartoonists, and writers all to write their, their pieces about the Vietnam War or whatever it was in culture in that day. And he goes, eventually, one day I decided, you know, I hated paying full price for music. And he said, so I decided to open a record shop in East London where I would sell all major labels and all major artists for 10 to 50% off of what you would get them at most record shops. And I threw an ad in the magazine, which was now circulating to 100,000 people. He goes, we had a queue, which is a line, a mile long in East London waiting for people to buy records at this shop. And he goes, so Virgin Record Shop began. It then turned into a record label because I found artists that I liked that no one else liked. And I found out that I had a good ear for finding talent, and it exploded from there. Another guy that they interviewed on this podcast is Horst Schultze, who I actually got to hear him speak in a small leadership setting a few years back in Atlanta. He lives in Atlanta. And uh, it's an amazing, inspiring story because he started, he was just a man from Germany, from, from very little means, and he started as a busboy in a luxury hotel in Germany. And, and he worked his way up to waiter, and he worked his way up eventually to maitre d' at one of the finest luxury hotels in Paris. And he decided as a maitre d' said, I think I can do luxury hotels better than anybody. And so he took a step, he jumped in the deep end, and he co-founded a little something called the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> he started the Ritz-Carlton. And I remember even in this little setting, there were probably 20 or 30 of us listening to his story, and someone asked him, how'd you do it? He goes, it started with a dream. It started with a beautiful vision for where I, I wanted to do and where I wanted to go in life. It started with a dream in my heart, and I could see it even though no one else could. Even though no one else could see it. And Richard Branson said the same thing. There was a dream in my heart to build businesses that would add value to people's lives, and, and nobody could see it but me. And when I'm thinking about the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah in chapter 2, he shows up to the city of Jerusalem. He walks up to the city of Jerusalem, and what does he see? It's, it's in ruins. It's a pile of rubble. He sees nothing there except stones that have been torn down by the Assyrians and the Babylonians in a city that was laid waste by its captors. But Nehemiah looked at the rubble, and he goes, I see something. I see a people of God rallied together around a common cause to build the city of God, to build a place where people can connect with God, can live in community together and change the world through worship. Nehemiah saw rubble, but he didn't see the rubble. He saw past the rubble and he said, there's something for us to build here. There's something for us to do here. There's a beautiful vision for where this is going. There's a beautiful vision for what I'm called to do and to be a part of. And so here's my simple question to us this morning as I think about Nehemiah and this idea of rising and building. Here's the simple question. Or do you understand the beautiful vision of what God wants to build with his church on planet earth? Do you understand the beautiful vision of what God wants to do in and through us here at Rolling Hills and in and through the church globally? What are we called to do? Who are we called to be? And right now, yes, if you look at the church across America, it looks like a pile of stones. If you look at us, I mean, we're messy. We're not a perfect church. There is no perfect church. We all have issues. We have junk that we bring to the table. And oftentimes, it looks like our walls are broken down and our gates have been burned by fire, just like Jerusalem. But the question is not, what do we look like now? It's who is God calling us to be and what are we called to look like? And so today I'm going to try and paint for us the beautiful picture of what God is calling his church to be. 
of what God is calling us to be of, and, and the role that we are called to play in it. Because, And I love how Nehemiah captures this idea of building. Because for 2,000 years, and I mentioned this, Jesus Christ has been building his church in the world. And, and the reason I know that it's not going to fail is because it started with a ragtag group of 12 fishermen on the backside of the desert in Galilee across the world. And now today, do you know how many professing Christians there are on planet Earth? I just looked this up on Wikipedia. <laughs> Not right now, like yesterday. <laughs> 2.18 billion. I mean, just check that. 2.18 billion people on planet Earth profess to be followers of Christ. You think Jesus was serious when he said, I'm going to build my church? You think he meant what he said when he said, nothing's going to stop me. The gates of hell will not prevail against this. Empires have tried to crush Christianity. Persecutors have tried to kill those who call themselves Christians. Politicians have tried to make it illegal, and they have made it illegal. Scientists have done their best to disprove it and to call it nonsense. And yet, here we are. And yet, we're still standing. We're still here. Jesus is still building. This is not some little blip on the radar of history. This is the central point, the central moving point of God in the planet shifting things up and calling us to be a part of the story that he is writing, the story that he is building. And here's why this is so important. Here is why this is so important because the local church is the hope of the world. Do you know why Jesus cares about this so much? Do you know why he's calling us to rise and build? Because you are called to be the hope of the world. And you say, wait a second, preacher. Wait, Jonathan. I know that's not right. Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of the world. Well, yeah, that's true. Jesus is the hope of the world. But who are we according to 1 Corinthians 12, 27? You are the body of Christ. And individually, you're members of it. You're the hands and feet of Jesus. You're the ones who carry the good news of the gospel. You are the physical manifestation and representation of Jesus, the hope of the world on earth. The local church is the hope of the world. This is why Jesus cares about building it. Romans 1.16, this is, this is the message we're called to carry. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I love that Paul goes, I am not ashamed of the gospel. The good news that Jesus Christ became a man and died for people that had rebelled against God so that we could go from death to life. I've said this before, the gospel is not about just making bad people a little bit better. It's about making dead people alive. It's about bringing the death to life. It's about, it's about us finding a completely new way of living in the world. It's not just about us having a little bit better life or a little more you know, cushion in our retirement account or just blessings in our life. And, and so many blessings follow those who follow Christ. That's indisputable. But the truth is, we are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. And so the local church is the hope of the world. This is who we are called to be. And so last week I asked, I said, what does it look like for us to build? What does it look like for us to build? And there's three things I think that we're called to do, gospel, community, and culture. The three building blocks of, of the church are really around this idea of gospel, community, and culture. Gospel is simply connecting people to God. It's the church. We are, we are the ones who carry the gospel, the power of God for the salvation of the world. Community is just connecting people to each other. Half the reason we closed off the room this morning was because it's a holiday weekend and it's snowing outside, and I thought there were going to be about eight of you here. But the other half of it was because every once in a while, you need to sit closer to people. You need to be able to hear them singing next to you. You need to be able to, to kind of feel the presence of people around you because the church is called to be a community. It's called to be a group of people that are linking arms and saying we are doing life together and we're building something together. We don't just show up once a week on a Sunday, but we're a part of building something to change the world, to bring hope to people. And then the third thing is culture. We as the church are called to be the church beyond walls, without walls. The church is not a building, it's a people. It's you, it's me. 
If this building was destroyed by an earthquake tomorrow, would Rolling Hills Church be gone? No. If this building was burned by fire tomorrow, would we, the church, be gone? No, we would still be standing. And you're called, and I'm called, to be salt and light in the world. We're called to, to make the world a better place everywhere that we go, to bring flavor and, and preservation to everything that we touch, whether we are high school teachers, police officers, firemen, businessmen, doctors, lawyers, politicians, stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads, whatever it is, you're called to make the world a better place through salt and light in what you do and called to be salt and light in the world so that people look at you and they say, what's going on? Why do they live like that? And they're attracted to Jesus inside of you. So we are called to build through connecting people to God, through inviting people to church, through sharing your faith, through praying for people, connecting people to each other through serving, through, through small groups, through being a part of things like Feed My Starving Children, through, through just being at church on Sunday mornings. And we're called to influence the culture with salt and light. This is what it looks like to build the church. And now today in Nehemiah chapter 3, we've seen the background of Nehemiah. We looked at Nehemiah 1 where he gets the word from Hanani, his brother, about the fact that the wall has been broken down in Jerusalem, about the fact that we need to go and rebuild. And so he prays to God in chapter 1. And, and Nehemiah, we see he's a man of action and prayer. He doesn't just sit, pray and sit back and say, God, I hope you do it. He prays and then he goes and actually becomes the fulfillment of what he's praying for. How many times do you know God does that? You start praying for something and he's like, okay, go ahead. I want you to be the answer to that. I want you to be the one that brings that to that person's life. So Nehemiah is a man of prayer and action. He goes and he inspects the walls at the end of chapter 2, secretly by night, and he sees the city in ruins and the walls in rubble. And then chapter 3, they begin to build. And it's this amazing thing, really, Nehemiah, the first step of Nehemiah, what he wants to build is he wants to build a wall. And I know how insane that is in this cultural moment right now and how controversial. I never thought as a preacher, I'm like, man, there's a lot of controversial things that I could preach about from the pulpit. Uh, so many things, but I never thought preaching about a wall has ever been so divisive or crazy in America right now. And so get the wall and the state of emergency out of your mind as best you can. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about a wall that Nehemiah wants to build around the city of Jerusalem to create a safe space for people to worship God and from the Assyrians and the other enemies around them that wanted to kill them. And so here is, here's what I want to argue from this whole idea in Nehemiah 3 is that what Nehemiah is trying to build is not just a physical structure, not just a city, but he's trying to build a place, a gathering place for the people of God to worship God for people of God to connect with God. And so what, I, what I'm arguing this morning is this, is we, the church, are representatives of this wall. We, the church, are living stones. Living stones, says Peter, who are built together into a dwelling place of God on earth. The church is supposed to be the physical representation of Jesus and God on earth. And so what Nehemiah is talking about here is so much more than just a wall and what I want to call us to and what I want to paint the picture of is what is the beautiful wall that we're called to be and the beautiful wall that we're called to build as Rolling Hills Church? And what, what role are you going to play in that? Which part of the wall are you going to build? Here's five building blocks that I think that we see from this text. And we've touched on some of these already. And really, if you think about these, um, I listened to a, a lecture this week from one of my favorite Bible teachers, a guy named Tim Keller. And he laid it out so well, he goes, often if you look across the world right now, you'll see five different types of churches in the world. You'll see gospel-focused churches and uh, churches where every week it kind of feels like a Billy Graham crusade and, and it's, uh, you know, don't come to church unless you bring a neighbor type thing who doesn't know Jesus. And it's all focused on evangelism, 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 evangelism churches. And everybody's equipped to do evangelism. You got evangelism churches, you got worship churches in the world. Churches where when people leave on Sunday morning, they're not talking about the sermon, they're not talking about who they saw, they're talking about worship. Like, man, that worship experience was amazing. 
You got people that are like, man, I just, just put me in a church that worships for like two hours straight. Some of you are like, I'd shoot myself in the head if I had to worship for two hours straight. That was a little extreme. You wouldn't do that. But at the end of the day, it's like, oh man, I'm, I'm more of a teaching. I want to be a part of a teaching church or a preaching church. There's other churches that are life needs or felt needs churches. And so they focus on recovery groups. They focus on, on marriage groups. They're going to have a Dave Ramsey course every single week to help you work through your life needs, right? There are other churches that are social concern churches where their main focus is the poor. Their main focus are, are advancing political causes like the ending of abortion or whatever it may be. We, we're going to go after social concerns, and that's kind of the main focus of our church. And then you have other churches that are teaching and discipleship-based churches where the moment you, know, you show up and the, the preacher gets up to preach, you hear the click, click, click of like a thousand notebooks opening and people ready to take notes. We're not a teaching church, are we? I guess. I'm just kidding. I know y'all are you're zoned in. You're taking notes in your mind. And so these are the different kind of churches that you see. But he goes, here's the problem. A church is called to major in all five of these things. These are actually the five building blocks of every good, balanced church. You should not have a church that only does one of these things. You are called to be a church. And, and part of building the wall is for us to say... Okay, how are we building structures in the church like this for people to be a part of? How are we doing things in the church that are building all of these things up so that people are, are coming to know Christ? So that people are encountering God through worship and not just worship on Sunday morning, but a lifestyle of worship where you work and your family living this out Monday through Sunday. A church that does focus on life needs, and I love this because we just hired a pastor, Matt Kowalski, who's going to be over this entire area of our church. He's going to be over the Celebrate Recovery, the Re-Engage Marriage, which has over 100 people coming to it every single week. He's going to be over grief share, divorce care. He's going to be over hitting the felt needs of our congregation, the real needs that we have as a people. We need to be a church that cares about the poor that cares about social concerns. We need to be a, a church that takes stands on these things. And that's why we have things like Christmas Shop and Operation Backpacks. And we want to launch Serve Days where we get out in the community and we just serve. And we have social concern. The, the church is called to have social concerns. And we want to be a church that makes disciples, that teaches God's word, and, and that, that has people who are equipped and they understand what it means to follow Christ. And so when I'm talking about building the wall, when I'm talking about what does this mean, what are the foundational stones, this is what I'm talking about. And so the question that you have to ask yourself is simple, which of these am I building? Which of these am I jumping into? Which of these am I, am I building? Which part of the wall that is Rolling Hills Church am I building? Because here's what I've learned from being a, uh, a soccer coach of an eight-year-old girl's soccer team. <laughs> simple, simple truth, simple truth. Alignment always leads to momentum. It's the next slide. There it is. Alignment produces momentum. Here's what I learned from Nehemiah 3 and from coaching eight-year-old girls in soccer. Alignment produces momentum. If the girls don't know what position they're playing... And one of the things we've been working with them on so hard as coaches this year is, girls, find your shape. And when we say find your shape, what we're saying is get into the right position on the field. And even if the ball is like on the other side of the field, stay put. Don't go running over there and cause a traffic jam with everybody else, right? And what inevitably happens about eight minutes into the game is everybody loses their shape, nobody has alignment, nobody has their position, and all 14 girls, 7v7, are crowded around one soccer ball, and it's a traffic jam. There's no alignment and there's no momentum. They can't get where they're wanting to go, but when they keep their shape, and when each one of them stays in their role, I mean, we had some beautiful goals this year where one's running down the right side, passes it to someone on the left side, dribbles a little bit, passes it to someone in the middle, and they shoot and score. And we're like, that's what soccer is supposed to look like. That's how it's supposed to go. Alignment always produces momentum. And so what Nehemiah did, I'm going to read these verses, is he created alignment around a common vision. He created alignment around a common cause, and the alignment produced momentum, and they got the wall built together. 
And so for us, my prayer is that we would find alignment as a church around gospel, worship, life needs, social justice, and discipleship. That we'd find alignment around this and you'd be able to look at the wall that we're trying to build and say, I think that's where I'm called to fit. That's where I'm called to build. That's what I'm called to do. And so Nehemiah in chapter 3, I, I love this because you look at Nehemiah chapter 3 and you're like, that's one of those chapters in the Bible that I just want to skip over. I don't want to read that. It's just a lot of names and a lot of details and I'll never remember it anyways. But there's beauty in the details here. Let me read this for us. Nehemiah 3, starting in verse 1. It's amazing. Then Eliashib, the high priest. Think about this. The high priest is getting his hands dirty. He rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built... And next to them, Zakur, the son of Emery, built. The sons of Asina built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Ariah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulah, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshezabel, <laughs> repaired. You all should give me some, like, cheering. I can't believe I'm getting through these names right now. <laughs> give me some encouragement, people. <laughs> next to them. Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired, and next to them, and this is the saddest verse in the entire chapter, next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. Now, think about this, okay? Think about, this is holy scripture right here. Can you imagine your name being included in the Bible simply because you took a pile of rubble, you took a stone, you put it on the ground, and then you grabbed another pile Another rock from the pile, and you put it on the ground next to that one. And God saw fit to include your name in the Bible because that's what you did. You built a wall. The mundane work of just one brick on top of another, of taking a pile of rubble and turning it into something beautiful, protective, and meaningful. Now, on the flip side, can you imagine being the one guy in Scripture that God included because you didn't want to do it? You said, I'm above that work. I'm above bricklaying. I'm a noble. And I, you know what blew my mind as I was reading this? All the names, it just name after name after name after name. And the two things that stuck out to me was this. Who are you building next to? Who are you next to and what are you building? And, and the, the phrase that just comes up, next to them, next to them, next to them, they laid stone. They picked up another piece and laid it on top. They repaired the gate. They did this. They did that. Next to, who are you next to? Right now, you're sitting next to somebody who's called to be a part of repairing the wall that is the church, who's called to be a part of connecting people through the gospel who's called to live a life of worship, who's called to, to be a part of the felt needs ministries of our churches, who's called to be a part of the social justice causes of our, nurse, of our church, who's called to be a part of making disciples. You're called, all of us are called to build the wall that is Rolling Hills Church, to lay one stone on top of the other. And there's such a contrast here. Think about this. I'm going to show us a map. Look at this map right here. So all these people, they built parts of the wall all the way around the city. And so many of them, I, I, I mean, if they would know that I just mentioned their names in Rolling Hills Church today, thousands of years after they were a part of building this, they'd be like, unbelievable. Someone's telling my story. Someone's talking about the fact that I just put another stone on the wall. But my favorite part of this whole thing is right down here. We'll call it the Dung Gate. The dung gate, this is the gate, it, it, this name says it all, that's where all of the dung in the city gets taken out of the city, so the city don't stink no more, amen? It's an important gate. But I want you to think about this. In verse 13 and 14, I want to read these. It says, the valley gate was repaired by Hanun, the residents of Zenoa. They rebuilt it. They put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. They also repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. But they were like, okay, we're done with the dung gate. We're not going to build the dung gate. We'll go right to here, but no further. And then it says this, verse 14. The dung gate was repaired by Malkijah, 
son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Hakarim. This dude was a ruler. He was like, you know, a governor, a high-ranking guy. Imagine him showing up to the rubble pile, backbreaking labor, picking up another stone and setting the sides of this gate, knowing that this is where all the crap from the city is going to be taken outside the city. And then contrast that with verse 5, the noblemen of the Tekoites who said, we won't stoop to build. And, and my prayer as I was reading it this week was, God, raise up an army of Malkajahs. <laughs> raise up an army of men and women that they're like, I don't care if I have to be on the parking team in the middle of a rainy day to welcome people in. I don't care what I have to I don't care if I, I look like a fool when I'm inviting people to church at work. I don't care if I have to serve on a Wednesday or Thursday night at a celebrate recovery group or a re-engage recovery group to be a part of building the church. I, I don't care what I have to do. I just want to be a part of laying the next stone. And I don't care if it's the dung gate or the worship center. It's all a part of the same building that God wants to build. It's all a part of the same thing. And so what are we building what is the church called to build and to be in the world? It's a living organism and it's an organization. And the question is, which part of these building blocks are you called to lay? Which stone are you called to lay here? And it's this reality of, you're like, look, the Lord's gifted me with people. I'm, I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm called to invite people. I'm called to share my faith wherever he's put me. I'm called to be praying for people. Now, we're all called to evangelism. We're all called to, to build the stone brick by brick of evangelism. A couple weeks ago, we had a baptism Sunday, and I heard this amazing story of this man who got baptized. And if uh, I haven't asked him if I could share this, so I'll keep his name anonymous. If you're here, man, I love you. But the, um, the amazing part of the story was he had, he had just moved back to town, and one of his friends who went to this church they had known each other from 20 years ago. He saw through social media that this guy had just moved back to town, and, and he texted him. He said, hey, man, saw you move back to the area. You want to go to church with me on Sunday? This was about three or four months ago. The guy says, sure. I haven't been to church in years, but I'll give it a shot. I'll go with you. He comes to church on a Sunday morning. His life gets encountered by the gospel. It gets rocked by the Lord. Three months later, he is on fire for Jesus and getting baptized as a new believer on a Sunday morning. It's just happened. And, I, you know, I'm sitting there talking to him, and he's like, man, you know, can you believe that, that the Lord connected me with this guy 20 years ago just so that I could invite him to church for one day and his life would be changed forever? The church is built one stone at a time, one brick at a time, and it's, built, it's, it's the, the mundane things, friends. It's the little things. It's the dung gates of the world. It's the, the things that nobody sees except God that you're a part of. It's showing up faithfully to lead a small group in high school or to watch a room full of kids in the kids' ministry or to be a part of the communion team, which if you're a part of the communion team, we're about to take communion, so here's your cue. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really this idea of like, how can I serve? It's being salt and light in the world. It's being a part of Feed My Starving Children. It's being a part of Operation Backpacks and Christmas Shop. It's being a part of all the different pieces of the wall that we are called to build. And it's just saying, like, we can't build the whole wall in a day, but we can lay one more stone today. I can shoot a text message and invite someone to church. I can show up to the men's group on Thursday night and step into a small group. I can be about the things that the wall that the God of the universe is calling me to build. And I'll end with this quote, this idea. I've said it before. I'm going to keep saying it. The simple idea. The church is not built on the extraordinary gifts of a few. It is built on the sacrifices of many. The church is not built on the extraordinary gifts of a few people. It's, it's you and it's me and it's everybody coming together saying, you know what? I'm going to put one more stone on the wall today. I'm going to invite somebody. I'm going to be a part of something. I'm going to give sacrificially. Whatever it is, I'm going to be a part of building the beautiful thing that Jesus has called the hope of the world, the church. It's who we're called to be. It's what we're called to be a part of. And it's what we're called to build. Amen?
Let's pray, and as our ushers come forward to pass out communion, I want us to think that the, the church, the thing that we're a part of, was purchased by the blood of Jesus. It was purchased by the blood of Christ. And so as this communion tray comes around, just take a moment to reflect on who Christ is and what he's done for you as the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your church. Thank you for the wall that you have called us to build here at Rolling Hills Church and the way that you've called us to be a part of what you're doing in the earth. Jesus, we love you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.